Once again, it is very wonderful to stand before you on this Lord's Day. Please have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5. This is our scripture reading earlier on in our worship service, and we will be referring to Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 through 42 at several different points in our lesson. It has been accused by some of Christianity's detractors that our religion is a religion of weakness and cowardice based on some passages like Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek and to give your coat to the one who wants to steal your shirt and to walk two miles with one who commands you to walk but one. Are you supposed to be a doormat though? Is that the point of passages like Matthew 5 and others? Is our faith a faith of weakness and cowardice. Well, if one didn't know any better, one might come to that conclusion because it sure seems like the consistent message of the New Testament is for Christians to just accept their place in the world as the doormat. In three different ways, I believe that this is seemingly apparent to outsiders or detractors of our faith. First, in our relationship to government. Turn to Romans chapter 13 and notice what the Apostle Paul has to say about government. As he says in Romans 13, beginning in verse 1, Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. And we know what he goes on to say in the next couple of verses about paying taxes and giving customs to whom they are due. That it is our responsibility as God's people in this world to submit to governing authorities. And of course, those who are dismissive of Christianity and its faith will say, well, what about Nazi Germany? Should we have resisted in that case? What if our own government does something so heinously terrible? Would we sit by and watch it happen? Should we be inactive during any kind of movement that would establish greater rights for our fellow countrymen? What about the civil rights movement? We'll talk about that a little bit later. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, though. I believe adds another element to this as the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, he says in verse 15, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. He goes on to say in verse 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. You could also add 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 in there as well, where it tells Christians to pray for those who have authority over us that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life. And yet, again, some of our detractors will say that a quiet and tranquil life is anything but what is needed in a time of unrest when big people need to stand up for what is right. In our relationship to earthly masters as well, we read in several passages in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, for example, and in 1 Peter 2 and verse 18, that we should submit to our earthly masters, whether in the first century to slave owners or to the 21st century to our bosses at our secular work. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, that it is good for the Christian to remain in the condition in which he was called. If one was called as a slave, remain as a slave. If one is called as a freeman, then remain as a freeman. So again, the question is, what if your boss is bad? What if we live in a time of slavery? Should we not rise up for the justice of our fellow man? Or should we just submit, submit, submit? And then back to that tricky passage in Matthew 5. In our relationship to those who are seeking our harm or our destruction. It has even been said by some that true Christianity, if you were going to practice it consistently, based on Matthew chapter 5, would mean that if a man broke into your house and tried to rape your daughter, then you should give him your wife also. And is that true? Is that what Jesus is really talking about there? That you should be such a doormat, such a 
Mr. Nice Guy, that you would not resist evil at all. I question that, though. Submit? Really? Let's look at each of these three things briefly before we move on to the life of Jesus Himself and the example that He gives us of resisting evil and speaking up when speaking up is necessary. This point about government and submitting to our government. We need to remember that when it comes to government, civil authority, even that which is established by God, we are never required to obey government when government and God have a conflict with each other. I'll give you several examples from the Old Testament, and then we'll note these examples from the New Testament as well. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26 of the Old Testament, in verses 16 through 19, King Uzziah, who was an otherwise good king, got a little full of himself and decided to enter the temple and offer incense himself, which was not lawful for him to do. It describes the resistance of the priests in the temple using the word in New American Standard as the priests opposed him. They opposed him. So you have a civil ruler entering the temple wishing to do his own will and God's own priests in the temple opposing him and telling him that what he was doing was wrong. In Exodus chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we read, we read about these midwives in Exodus 1 who were given a command by the Pharaoh to destroy every male Hebrew as it exits the womb. And instead of complying, they lie and help hide the Hebrew male babies. Now, for their resistance against civil authority, it says in verses 20 and 21 that God bless these midwives. You have God's blessing then upon those who are clearly, clearly disobeying government. 2 Kings chapter 11, we read about the story of Queen Athaliah. Athaliah, the wicked king who was a relation of old King Ahab, decided to destroy all the heirs to the throne, but one. A little boy, a baby named Joash, who was hidden for six years in the temple by the high priest Jehoiada. And after six years, Jehoiada the priest decided it was time for a coup. Queen, Athel uh, Queen Athaliah needed to go. And he brings the little boy, seven years old at the time, out and presents him as king to the people. Again, you have a man inciting a coup against civil authority. And in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, the apostles are told to no longer preach in the name of Jesus Christ. And the apostle Peter, in words that ring true today, he says, you tell me, is it right for us to listen to you or to obey God? We'll keep speaking the name of the Lord. If the goal, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, is to lead a quiet life, then I believe passages like Romans chapter 13 and 1 Peter 2 need to be qualified. Because if your passivity when it comes to evil and government does not result in a quiet and tranquil life, then clearly something is not, doing, not going right. Our goal is a quiet and tranquil life and sometimes, sometimes being passive in the face of an evil government does not meet that end. So when God and government are at odds, we are never required to obey government. As for earthly masters, we serve masters as a means to an end. And I think even in passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 20 where it says, if you're a slave, then remain a slave. If you're a freeman, remain a freeman. I think we understand all these passages, including Colossians chapter 3, to mean you don't really serve human masters. In the end, we serve God. And we might serve a human master for a time in this life, but that's not eternity. And like Colossians chapter 3 says, don't work for a human master as if you're working for a human master. Work for that human master as if you are actually working for God because He ultimately is our master. So we serve human masters as a means to an end. For influence in this world, even influence with a master, to try and influence our boss or our master to become a Christian himself. Stability for our families, learning appreciation for our true master who is the Lord, and the means to help others financially. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says, Let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, 
with his hands doing what is good so that he can share with those who have a need. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Let those who are rich in this present world learn to share with those who have a need. That's why we work. Not because we really are under the hand of an earthly master, but because we're free in Christ and we know that that is a means to an end. And on our relationship to those seeking our harm, Jesus, even in Matthew 5, never commanded us to be doormats or to be too nice to stop anybody from harming us. That was never part of the deal in Matthew 5. And Jesus' own life illustrates this. If Matthew chapter 5 is commanding us to be the doormats of the world, Jesus didn't follow his own advice. Detractors sometimes will turn to the example of Jesus to show the precedent for the built-in cowardice of Christianity. They'll point to prophecies, like in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, where Jesus is described by prophecy as one who was silent and would not open his mouth. Other prophecies in Isaiah describe Jesus as little more than a wind that wouldn't burn out a flame, that wouldn't break even a bruised reed. And they'll say, see, even the master of your religion, even the Lord in your religion was a complete coward, wouldn't stand up for himself, wouldn't speak on his own behalf, wouldn't resist when evil faced him. But again, is that actually how Jesus lived his life? And if you've read the life of Jesus, you know that that is absolutely not true. Because while it's true that there are stretches of silence, to fulfill that prophecy, Jesus is also shown, even at the end of his life, defending himself and challenging somebody like Judas in Luke chapter 22 and verse 48. He wasn't silent before Judas. He confronted Judas. And he and Judas, even if the other disciples didn't acknowledge it, he and Judas knew what was happening. He confronted the soldiers who arrested him in Matthew 26 and verse 55. He confronted them. He told them the truth. He confronted the high priest, I think most famously in John chapter 18. Notice in verse 19. And again, if Matthew chapter 5 is to be taken as literally as some people would have it, then Jesus doesn't take his own advice. As it says in verse 19, the high priest therefore questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews came together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. Behold, these know what I said. And when he said this, one of the officers standing by gave Jesus a blow, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Now, instead of turning the other cheek, what does Jesus do? He says, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Instead of turning the other cheek, Jesus defends himself, his honor, and his integrity. He says, if you have a right to strike me, then fine, strike me. But you tell me what I've done wrong before I turn the other cheek. He offers an explanation of his silence in John 19, verses 9 through 11. Pilate continues to push him and push him and push him and says, don't you, ha don't you know that I have the power and the authority to destroy you or to spare you? Don't you understand that? Why are you so silent? Why won't you speak up for yourself? And Jesus explains that in John chapter 19. Jesus was not always silent. Jesus also overturned tables. He was no doormat. And we, of course, look at the example in John chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, where he used force, physical force, crafting a whip for himself when it was necessary to show his love for God's holiness and the holiness that was supposed to be regarded in the temple. He used very strong language in Matthew chapter 23. Look at some of the words that he uses to describe the Pharisees and the scribes in that chapter. Hypocrites. That's no word that you throw around lightly. Notice some of the things that he says here. Go to Matthew chapter 23. In verses 24 and 25, you blind guides. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish. Inside, you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. He calls them hypocrites again in verse 29. And notice verse 33. You serpents, you brood of vipers. And to that point, he even goes on to say, How shall you escape the sentence of hell? 
You know, for a man who some would say was a coward, he sure spoke about hell openly and was willing to tell it how it was to those who needed to hear it. He was politically incorrect and he offended people. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 12. A great little detail here that as Jesus is talking about obedience to God and regarding human tradition over the commandments of God, it says here in verse 10, we'll begin in verse 10 for context, after he called the multitude to him, he said to them, hear and understand, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. And in verse 12, the disciples came and said to him, do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard that statement? So they're offended. Jesus wasn't afraid of offending people if the truth was what was offensive. And his patience also had limits in Matthew 17 and verse 17. Oh, unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? And in the parable that's described in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, which we'll read here. Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. A certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, Jesus said. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? He answered him in verse 8 and said, Let it alone, sir, for this year too until I dig around it and put fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. Now, is God patient? Is Jesus incredibly patient? Yes, but his patience has limits. Jesus was no doormat, and he did not expect his people to be doormats of the world either. So what are we to make of this statement then in Matthew chapter 5 of turning the other cheek and walking two miles and giving him your coat also and do not resist him who is evil? What are we to make of this statement? What Jesus teaching in Matthew chapter 5 was in contrast to the popular idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Essentially, it was about getting even with your enemies. That if your enemy knocks a tooth out, then it is your right to knock his tooth out. That if your enemy hurts your eye, then it is your right to hurt his eye as well. Which, of course, only results in a room full of blind people. So rather than seeking our own good and getting even with our enemies, Jesus suggests an alternative to that. And he suggests that more good can actually be done in this world and among our enemies by disarming them with a weapon that they are not expecting at all, which is love. To love. To love is to end the cycle of violence. To love is to reject an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. To love is to be like Christ. And to love is not passive. Love is not a doormat. Love is not Mr. Nice Guy who lets anybody have whatever they want. Paul, of course, elaborates on this in Romans chapter 12, which we don't have time to study this morning. That's a sermon all on its own, but he does say there, beginning in verse 17, Never repay evil for evil. Never take your own revenge, my brethren. Leave room for the wrath of God. Instead of taking revenge, Paul says, do good to your enemies. Feed them. Give them something to drink. Show them love. And in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon their head. Now, the burning coals, by the way, is not your own kind of revenge. You don't do nice things for your enemy so I can heap burning coals on his head and make him feel really guilty about being mean to me. No, I believe the burning coals is the seared conscience, that when you do good to your enemies, you sear their conscience, you burn their conscience with those burning coals that hopefully, ideally, leads to a change in that person's life. We're told to resist the devil. So if we're supposed to take Matthew chapter 5, 39 so literally that do not resist him who is evil... How do you square Matthew 5.39 with James 4, verse 7, when you're supposed to resist the devil, 
who's the most evil of them all. We're supposed to expose evil in Ephesians 5 and verse 11. Don't ignore evil. Don't turn away from it. Don't turn a blind eye. Don't allow evil to go unmolested. We expose evil and fight against it in this world. We must be bold in the face of our suffering, according to 1 Thessalonians 2.2 2 and Philippians 1 and verse 20. We're never supposed to be cowardly people, since cowardice is listed among sins that will result in being eternally left in the lake of fire in Revelation 21, verse 8. We must be willing to rescue widows and orphans in their distress in James 1, verse 27, for that is part of true religion. And if you see widows and orphans being harmed, you see them in their distress, you see them being abused, it is our Christian obligation not to ignore that, but to fight against it. To give our lives to save others, John 15, verse 13. No greater love has any man than this, than to lay down his life for a friend. My dear friends, turning the other cheek is not passive and cowardly. Rather, turning the other cheek is powerful, it is active, and it is disarming to our enemies. After all, a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye is humanity's natural preset, isn't it? It's our default setting, that if you hurt me, then I should be able to hurt you back. And anybody who has read anything of Middle East history understands that that eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth mentality is alive and well today. That you're going to shoot a rocket across my border, so I'll go and blow up a school bus on your side of the border. Well, if you're going to blow up a school bus on my side of the border, then, then I'm going to blow up a marketplace on your side of the border. Well, if you blow up a marketplace on my side of the border, I'm going to bomb a hospital on your side of the border. And what are we left with? But death and rubble. Just death and rubble. That is humanity's natural preset. So Jesus is offering us an alternative to our natural, self-destructive default setting. End the cycle of violence and rather show love. And look again at the words Jesus uses. These are not passive words. Turning the other cheek is doing something. It's not passive. To turn the other cheek is an action. It is a choice. In fact, Turning the other cheek is perhaps the most powerful thing you can do when faced with your enemies. He says, turn the other cheek. That is an active word. When someone tells you to go a mile with them, you go and walk two miles. Go, walk. Those are active words. When someone wants to take your shirt, you give your coat also. Turn, walk, go, give. Don't tell me that Matthew 5 is about passivity and cowardice. Now, these are some of the most active words that we can possibly imagine. So what would this look like in real life? If we want to find some way of reconciling these two seemingly irreconcilable ideas of we must be people of action called to fight and resist evil, but we also must turn the other cheek, what would a life like this look like? And I know that we could look to the example of Jesus, which we will hear at the end of the lesson. But I want to give you a purely human example. A person from history who you perhaps have heard of in the past. There was a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian and preacher. And before World War II, he very vocally opposed Nazi policies in Germany. He had an opportunity to stay in the United States before World War II broke out, and his friends in the States begged him not to go back to Germany. But in 1939, at one of the last opportunities to travel from the United States to Germany before war broke out, he chose to go back. He simply believed that he would be a hypocrite if he didn't stay and suffer with the German people and then expect to help rebuild German Christianity after the war. Once he was in Germany, of course, he was stuck there. There was no leaving after that. And for 18 months near the end of the war, he was kept in prison. The last place that he was kept was a concentration camp where he went through a mock trial where there were no witnesses and he was not offered counsel. 
after which he was hanged to death. Hanged to death because he vocally, vehemently, but non-violently resisted one of the most evil forces that human history has ever seen come to fruition. What could he have done? Pick up a gun and fight? He was one German Christian among millions who loved and adored their Fuhrer. He knew that he couldn't pick up a gun and fight Germany, but he could go and preach and be an example, and he could love, and he could suffer, and he could die, and he could die. A few practical applications to consider as we bring our lesson to a close. I believe that our submission must serve a purpose. That when we turn the other cheek, and when we give to the one who asks, and when we walk that second mile, there has to be a purpose behind it. Jesus is not prescribing purposeless, pointless submission to other people, but He is prescribing service to other people. So when the detractors of Christianity come in and say, well, based on your own text, if a guy broke into your house and wanted to rape your daughter, you'd have to give him your wife also. That is purposeless suffering. And on top of all of that, don't we have to consider the love of our neighbor, our very closest neighbor, our spouse and our children? When Jesus talks about turning the other cheek in Matthew chapter 5, He is saying, turn the other cheek so that you can change the world. Turn the other cheek when turning the other cheek will flip upside down your enemies. Turn the other cheek when turning the other cheek is the most powerful weapon that you have at your disposal to change the heart of someone who wants to see your destruction. That is purposeful, purposeful suffering. Not empty suffering. Not empty suffering. After all, even the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22, beginning in verse 22, didn't just prescribe to purposeless suffering or pointless suffering. When he was threatened with beating by Roman guards, he turns to them and he says, Is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen like this under these circumstances? And they're all in fear because they realize that Paul held dual citizenship and had his own citizenship in Rome. Paul wasn't just going to sit there and have purposeless suffering just for the sake of it. No, if he had the choice not to suffer, well, he was going to take every legal opportunity not to suffer. Not only that, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the very text that we turn to that seems to suggest passivity, in verse 21, it says that if you are able to become a freed person, if you are able to get out of slavery then do it, for that would be so much better. We are allowed to say no at times, because even Jesus Himself, two chapters later in Matthew 7, says, Do not cast your pearls before swine, and do not give what is holy to dogs. I believe that means we can say no. And if I turn the other cheek and it results in casting my pearls before swine, or if a swine comes and tries to take my coat also, or if a swine tells me to walk two miles with him, I believe I'm allowed to say no. Stop being passive in your relationships as well. Whether it's your marriage, or your relationship to your kids, or to bullies. We are not commanded by God to be passive in these relationships. If anything, we are given examples of those who are assertive, strong and confident who will proactively deal with bullies. Diotrephes, for example, in 3 John, verses 9 and 10, notice what Paul or John has to say about this problem here of Diotrephes, who was a bully in a congregation. He says in verse 9, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words and not satisfied with this. Neither does he himself receive the brethren, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. What John is saying is, I don't have to take it lying down when somebody calls into question my integrity. And as a church, we don't have to take it lying down when a Diotrephes rises up and tries to bully us into submission and tell us what to do. We're allowed to deal with the diatrophies of the world. We're allowed to deal with that. 
And finally, when we do serve others, even those who are wicked, I think it shows that we get it when it comes to serving God. Think of it this way. If I can learn how to serve a master or a boss who is wicked in this world, if I can learn to submit to a government that has its inherent flaws, if I can learn to submit to other people, even those who are seeking my harm, who wish to strike me on the cheek and take my coat and force me to walk two miles, if I can learn to submit and serve my enemy's needs, how hard do you think it's going to be to learn to submit and serve my God? My God who loves me, who does not strike me, who does not steal from me, who does not poke and prod and annoy and harm and destroy me. If I can learn to serve in this world, then I get it. I get it. We studied John 13 in our Bible class this morning. Jesus, who says, I am Lord and I am teacher and don't you forget it. But I stripped down to servants' clothes and washed your feet and left you an example to follow. If Jesus could serve the world the way he did and die on a cross for the very people who were spitting upon him and <laughs> jeering at him and casting insults at him, and if Jesus himself could look at that same rabble and say, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they're doing, then can't I learn from his example and serve in the same way? My friends, if you're not a Christian here this morning, then you really ought to be. Make the choice to serve God now, and you will see the reward in the afterlife, and a life changed forever. Whatever need you might have, please come forward as we stand and sing.